Hello, today we're going to talk about the famous Papyrus 52 and we're going to ask the question of whether it really is the oldest piece of the New Testament that has survived for all these thousands of years. Um, so let's go to our little introductory slide. So uh, experts tend to say that this, uh, this famous papyrus called the Rylands Library Papyrus P52 is the oldest surviving fragment of a New Testament book. And you can see some pictures of it right here, the front and back of it. It's uh, very small. They say it's about the size of a little index card, pretty much, if even that. Um, and it's usually dated to the year 125 AD, which is very early. It's a, it would essentially be the oldest piece of Christian writing that we have, um, and the oldest uh, piece of New Testament writing. It preserves passages, or shall I say portions, of a few verses from John chapter 18. So we're going to ask, why is it dated to the year 125? And is this date actually correct? So let's start with uh, describing how this papyrus, or this piece of papyrus, was discovered, because this is important for answering our question. In 1920, an Egyptologist named Bernard Grenfell, who's pictured here, uh, uh, bought many papyri from the antiquities market in Egypt. So he was over there and he found this collection and he sifted through uh, this collection of different documents and bought what he thought were the best ones uh, for the, uh, the library in England. And P52 was included in that purchase, of course not under that name. The name was added later by the librarians. Um, but Grenfell didn't really talk about uh, the piece of the Gospel of John because he must not have considered it very significant. In fact, he didn't really even mention it in his letters to the other librarians. He mostly focused on the, the other classical works that uh, existed and that sort of thing. But about 15 years later, in 1935, a man named Colin Roberts examined this little piece of the Gospel of John, and he dated it to the early 2nd century which was a really big deal because this meant that it would be that it was the oldest surviving piece of the New Testament. And even though it went uh, for 15 years without being uh, studied very much by scholars, it quickly became famous uh, because it suddenly was 100 years older than all the other New Testament documents that we had. And so at that point, scholars swarmed around it and began to study it a lot more. So let's take a, a closer look at the fragment itself. I personally really enjoy doing this, uh, looking at the original language and seeing the transcripts and the translations, and I like to share that with you on the videos here. So this is a high-resolution picture. You can find these pretty easily online because this is a very famous, very famous document, and I have included the Greek transcription over here and the English translation over here. So you can see the little the uh, little Omicron, uh, an Iota, an Upsilon, and so on. And uh, it really just preserves a few words here and there, which you, you couldn't really tell a lot about what it says by itself. You have to compare it to the more complete copies of the Gospel of John that we have in order to understand what it says. But you can see here that it says, the Jews to us, anyone so that the word spoke indicating... Um, uh, die entered a uh, praetorium and said Jews. So obviously that's devoid of a lot of context, uh, context because of the holes in the document here and here and this page is just ripped out of ripped out of place. But scholars have figured out what it what it has said based on other copies of the Gospel of John and if you want to know uh, what that complete passage is you can just go look up John 18 in any translation or original version of the uh, Bible that you would like to like to check out. So here's the other side of the fragment, the verso side, and clearly this has uh, parts of Jesus talking, and it says, uh, "For this I have been born, world so that I would test of truth." Said to him, and this the Jews not one, and that's it. So there isn't much information or wording on this particular piece of papyrus, but it does show that from a very early period we have attestation of the Gospel of John floating around among the early, uh, among the early Christians. 
and that's what gives us this uh, uh, date of 125. Actually, that's not what gives us the date, but what I should say is that it's the earliest because that's what people say about it. But that's the next uh, question we're going to ask, as you can see here. How do we get to this, this date of 125, and is it even, is it even correct? because that's been the claim for the past hundred years or so uh, that this text goes back to the year 125 AD more or less. Well there are a few different ways to date ancient manuscripts and you can see some of those here. One is the archaeological context and what this means is that you can look at the surrounding area and dirt and artifacts um, near where the manuscript was found. So you know in archaeology when you do excavations you go through different layers of uh, of dirt and ground and that sort of thing and when you dig things up and you discover things you can compare the artifacts not only to the layer of ground that they were discovered in but also to the different artifacts themselves and compare all of those together to figure out to figure out how old the uh, artifact uh, is that you're trying to study that's considered a very you know very tried and true reliable way to date things but the other way of course is much newer and that's radiocarbon dating, which is where you take carbon-14 uh, samples from the artifact and then uh, use that scientific method to figure out the uh, range of date, and that's also considered very accurate. And then the third method is paleographic analysis, which is considered the least accurate, um, and the way you do this is that you compare the shapes of the letters and other such things in the document to the wider range of uh, ancient documents that exist and whichever uh, manner in which the letters match up is how you can place the age of the document because different decades in ancient history would have, dif would have different ways of writing the letters so if you write the uh, if you're living in the second century AD and you write your alphas a certain way it would be able uh, you could be able to figure out that it's from the second century based on the fact that other second century documents write that letter in the same way. So in an ideal world, all three of those me methods can and should be used to discover how old an artifact is, but that's not always possible. And that's the case with um, P52. We can't use methods one and methods two. We can't use the archaeological context to date P-52 because it was bought on the antiquities market in 1920. In other words, archaeologists didn't dig it up. They bought it from somebody who already dug it up or found it who knows where, and there was no record of it or anything, because a lot of the people who discover these artifacts, they don't uh, date them, or they don't keep records of, of where they found them and how they found them, so all that archaeological context is gone. So you can't use that to figure out the date of P-52. And additionally, radiocarbon dating can't be used, but it's for a different reason. The reason you can't uh, use um, carbon-14 dating is that if you did it, you would have to take off a big piece of the uh, document, which as we know is already really small. P-52 is really, really small. You would essentially destroy a huge amount of the find if you were to do it. So the scientists and the archaeologists don't want to use carbon dating because they don't want to essentially destroy the original. So that just leaves us with uh, paleography. And uh, that's why the, the paleographers have come up with this date of 125, because they think that the writing style matches the early 2nd century. But how likely is this, uh, this dating of the year 125? Well, only paleography can be used to date the document. So uh, some scholars have argued that uh, the date of 125 is, is put out there too much, with too much confidence. They think that popularizers and many people in the general public have uh, too much certitude about the, the idea that this text is from the year 125. And so there are some new proposals uh, very recently uh, given, such as uh, this one by Brent Nongbri. Uh, and uh, he argues that... Uh, the possible date range, based on the paleographic evidence, extends into the 3rd century, about 75 years after the date that's usually assigned for P52. So a lot of people say that the, uh, the papyrus is from the year 125 
and Nogbri says basically that that is true that that could be the case but it's not necessarily the case it could be from 150 it could be from 175 it could be even be past the year 200 we just don't know because we have only one method to use to date the uh, the document so uh, unfortunately that means we can't answer the question of the video in the way that we wanted to which is uh, is this document really the oldest piece of the New Testament uh, and it looks like we'll just have to content ourselves with saying that it is one of one of the oldest if not the oldest there are about, I think, three or four other documents that could just as easily be the oldest uh, manuscript of the New Testament. I think little pieces of Matthew, for example, uh, could be older than this on the paleographic evidence. But in any case, that doesn't mean that P52 is not important. Uh, on the contrary, it's, it is, it's very important, even if it is from the 3rd century, because it's still one of the oldest fragments that we have. Well, uh, that's all I have to say, and uh, thank you for watching.